Welcome to Dishonored 2. Now, last month we covered the first game and all of its painstaking DLC. After living my life thinking I hated this franchise, upon going through the achievement grind for it, I quickly became aware that this is in fact a fantastic game and I had it all wrong. However, would the sequel fare as well as the first? Would I enjoy it as much and does it improve on the amazing story and gameplay that I had grown to love from the one that came before it? Well, you all wanted this, so it's time to go through the sequel for the very first time and to see if it holds up to the original, as we grind all 50 achievements that this game has to offer. And it goes without saying that if you haven't seen my videos on the Dishonored and its DLC, I heavily suggest that you watch those before this, as they set up a lot of the context in this game that I won't really have full time to explain. But without further ado, let's get straight into it. Welcome to the achievement grind. Now, Dishonored 2 is set 15 years after the ending of the last game, and now it starts with a grown-up Emily arriving at a ceremony in her mother's honour. After meeting Corvo, your event is quickly interrupted by clockwork soldiers, Duke Luca Abel of Sakonos, and a familiar face that for those that played the first game's DLC, Delilah Copperspoon, or should I say Delilah Caldwin, supposedly Jezamine's half-sister and true heir to the throne. Now at the start of the game it is told that there is a serial killer called the Crown Killer. They call this as they appear to be killing Emily's enemies making many believe that Emily and Corvo are responsible. So after a brief interaction with Delilah we are of course attacked by the Duke and we get to choose our first distinction that separates this game from the one that came before it. We get to choose who to play as. We can either continue the story as Corvo or start as Lady Emily. Both having completely separate powers and abilities, and of course both having completely different achievements tied to them. So, to start, we chose Lady Emily. Corvo is then turned into marble and we are hauled away to our bedroom. It is now time to escape and start our pacifist playthrough once again, so no being spotted and no killing. We started by working our way through the castle again to get our signet ring back off Mortimer Ramsey, one of the henchmen that dethroned me. So after a moment we find him, give him a very nice and satisfying choking session before taking our ring back also getting our first achievement Imperial Seal. Now this ring unlocks a specific bookcase that Sokolov invented for us and inside are some of the tools that we will need to continue. So we grab Ramsey, throw him inside the room and lock it behind us. He wanted entry to this room so that he could steal all the gold there, so he got his wish and he is neutralised. But we also eat all of his food and there's no possible chance of him escaping. Bad luck Mr Ramsey, you absolute donkey. Now we're out into the streets of Dunwall, so after a couple of minutes of sneaking past guards and diving into the water, we find ourselves on a boat called the Dreadful Will, and upon it is a blind and armless character who is apparently waiting for us. This is Megan Foster, and she arrived here to try to warn us about the Duke's coup. Instead, she offers us to be taken to Karnaka, where Delilah began her rise to power and where we can start in finding the Crown Killer, as well as ways to take back the crown from Delilah. Upon completing the first mission, we also get the achievements Ghostly for completing a mission without being spotted, and Alternative Approach for killing nobody in a mission. During the night we are then visited by our favourite emo, Odin the Outsider, who of course visits us to grant us amazing powers and to tell us to take Delilah out. We of course accept his gracious offer this time, and we get our powers as well as the heart, as this time it seems to be holding the spirit of our mother Jessamine. We then wake up normally and meet Megan to come up with a plan of attack. The first thing that we need to do is find and take out the Crown Killer, so that we can claim our innocence in the deaths. The Crown Killer is rumoured to be hiding out in a building called the Adamire Institute, so we need to travel there to find out for ourselves. So, we immediately set out for Kanaka. Now, the first thing you notice, other than the achievement Jewel of the South popping, is that Karnaka is a totally different landscape and setting to that of Dunwall. Gone are the grey tones in every part, as Karnaka is full of life. The sun is out, there are people everywhere, and honestly, this to me is amazing. I thought Karnaka was immediately stunning, and it's a lovely change of pace from the dark and dingy Dunwall. I mean, come on, this is beautiful. And I also gotta mention the graphics. Not only are the graphics stunning, but they keep their amazing art style that they had in the first. They have just perfected it and brought it up to a very HD level, which is stunning to see. So, so far, after a single mission and being brought here, I'm very happy with the game's direction, but we will have to continue to see if the rest of the game still holds up. We begin exploring the world and getting further and further throughout it. Eventually, we meet this relaxing lady who says that she has a quest for us, to go and grab a body from the Overseer's outpost, and by doing this she will help us get to the Institute. And that's good enough for me, so we trek straight there, silently take out all of the guards throughout the building before bringing the body back and throwing it in this lovely hole. Upon chucking the corpse into the mud, we also get the achievement Morbid Theft. 
By doing this, she also says that one of her guys has turned off the power to the rails, which gives us a direct line to take and reach the carriage that will take us straight to the Institute. So we run, hop in the chair, and complete our first mission without killing anybody and without being spotted. A wonderful start. Now, at the start of the next mission, we reach the Institute, which is a former solarium for wealthy citizens of Kanaka, now turned into like a research center for infectious diseases led by somebody called Dr. Hypatia. But we're here to find the crown killer and to find out where they took Sokolov, who we need to find and rescue eventually. Now, the Institute is a disgusting building filled with guards, death and disease. So we need to trek carefully on our way to find out more information. However, it doesn't take us long to find Dr. Hypatia's office. Inside, we find a key to the recuperation area as well as a note that gives us the opportunity to talk to somebody called Hamilton, who may have more information for us. Eventually, we find him, and he isn't doing well. He was locked up for looking at the Crown Killer, but we can go and find his notes for further information. It turns out he did in fact see the Crown Killer dragging a body, but everyone gaslit him into thinking that he was just mad and to stop spreading silly rumours. So, after this, the next step is to talk to Dr. Hypatia herself in the recuperation area, which, again, we found fairly easily. But in talking to her, it's clear that she isn't all there. She's hearing voices, she doesn't really understand much or anything that she's doing. So, whilst exploring, we also find out that Sokolov has been taken prisoner into a mansion owned by Kirin Jindosh, the Duke's grand inventor and the genius behind the clockwork robots and other things that we'll get into later. And then also on the path, we stumble across a horribly bent and abused person, who immediately tells us that Dr. Hypatia is actually the Crown Killer. And in a sort of Banner and Hulk situation, where at times the Crown Killer will emerge from Hypatia, wreak havoc only for Hypatia to not remember a thing, as she's being poisoned to do so. This is also very quickly confirmed by Hypatia herself when she kills the person by needlessly throwing shit and disappearing. But now we have the non-lethal takedown option. What we need to do is craft an anti-serum that will remove the crown killer once and for all. By getting the base serum, mixing it with the blood of an infected corpse and then injecting that into her. So that's exactly what we do. And once completed, the crown killer is no more and Hypatia is back with us, albeit confused and a little bit weak. And we get the achievement, the beast within. We then tell Hypatia to go and meet Megan on the boat to lay low, the crown killer is no more, and with that we then meet Megan back on the boat ourselves to prepare to go after Sokolov. Back on the boat we also quickly speak to Hypatia again who thanks us for saving her and rewards us with our next achievement, Counter Serum, before we then embark on our next quest. Now in the intro we have to make our way to the mansion, but honestly nothing really of note happens here so I'ma skip it to when we actually finally make it to the front doors. Once through and within seconds we are shown exactly why Jindosh is the grand inventor, as by pulling several switches around his mansions, they will completely change the layout, revealing enemies, new doors, and honestly, to begin with, this was quite intimidating, as I knew to go through silently, this would take quite a bit of work and quite a bit of patience, but we pressed on. After pulling the lever, Jindosh detects us and insists that we talk to him which we do. He susses within moments that we are there to take him out and to take Sokolov, so he basically says, come try me bitch. So we do. Now again, I really need to speak on how highly amazing this mission and level is. The design is simply phenomenal, and this instantly became one of my favourite missions, as every path had obviously been thought of by developers, as no matter where you ended up in this twisting mansion, there was always a way back out, which really impressed the hell out of me. But slowly and patiently we explored the mansion, taking out soldiers until we eventually find the assessment chamber where Sokolov is being held captive. To rescue him, we must step into the prison cell and stand on these special pads that lower and raise walls until we have a direct path to him, all whilst avoiding the beefiest of the clockwork soldiers. Thankfully, we do just that fairly easily, and at last we are reunited with the now much older and delicate Sokolov, who then warns us that Jindosh is building an army of soldiers and must be taken out. We agree, of course, and unlock the achievement Labyrinthine Mind, before then grabbing the sweet old bastard and carting him outside into the carriage to take back with us later on. But now it's time to take out Jindosh. Now, outside the prison cell, we find a note that told us about the electrical lobotomy chair that he was planning to use on Sokolov so that he couldn't use his genius mind anymore. Rather fitting, as now that's exactly what we're going to do to Jindosh, and take care of him non-lethally. After a little while, we make it to his room where he is protected by two clockwork soldiers. We need to take them both 
out silently as we can't get spotted, so we take him out from the shadows with bombs and bolts before then finding the special chair and chucking Jindosh in to have all the wrinkles ironed out of his brain. Mission successful, it's time to go home. Back on the boat, Sokolov then reveals that whilst in the mansion, he learned the identity of one of Delilah's chief allies, Brianna Ashworth, an architect of the coup that took the throne away from Emily, and that she has been building a rather odd device for Delilah and that we need to take her out. So, we set off. Now, this mission starts as the same as the others, fight through the city until we reach the building where Brianna lives. Once there, we sneak our way inside to a place filled to the brim with witches. So, we take some out and avoid others until we reach the strange contraption that Brianna is creating, called the Auriculum. And through a bit more exploring, we find a pile of lenses and a note that says that on a previous experiment, it went horribly wrong and nearly wiped Brianna of her powers, and that the lenses should not be used in the future, as if they are, Brianna may permanently lose her powers and connection to Delilah, which sounds bloody good to us. So, we swipe the lenses, plant them in the machine, and turn it on, to which Brianna is immediately summoned and, as expected, loses her powers and connection to Delilah. Also, weirdly enough, by doing this, every single witch in the level is knocked unconscious, which really works out for us, but I don't know why. So, like in the Dishonored DLC, we talk to a statue of Delilah, and we brag about how great we are and what we have done, and then Delilah scolds me for being a meddling kid without a dumb dog. And that's the mission done. Honestly, I really did enjoy this mission, but it was notable for me as the easiest of the bunch. As my first time playing it with no knowledge, we finished it in about 40 minutes. Oh well, back to the boat. Next, we must travel to the Dust District to find a manor belonging to Aramis Stilton, as this manor contains more of Delilah's secrets that we need in order to figure out a way to beat her. Upon arriving, Megan tells us that we need to get past a door that was designed by Jindosh, and that in the Dust Districts there are two factions fighting for power, and if we kill one of the leaders and bring their body to the other, they can tell us the code. Or, we could just try solving the riddle for ourselves. Now, through looking at my friend's achievements in the Dishonored tab on Steam, I already knew that there was an achievement for unlocking the door without a code from the leader. So, we headed straight there and tried to beat the riddle. Now, this was a complex riddle, I can't lie, and it took me about 40 minutes and an envelope full of doodles to figure out, but eventually, the lock pops, and so does the achievement Eureka, as we set off into the next mission. Upon entering the house, we lose the ability to use any of our powers, which doesn't seem too bad at first since there appears to be nobody around. We explore and eventually find and Aramis Stilton playing the piano, but he has clearly lost his mind. The outsider then appears and gives us something called the timepiece to help with our quest, a special artifact that upon using can transport us back in time. With this, we need to trek through the mansion once again, constantly swapping timelines in order to reach a room in which we know that Duke Luca and some of his friends are visiting. And also, by picking up the timepiece, we get our next achievement, a 1918-49. And again, I really need to sing Dishonored 2's praises here, as this mission is simply incredible incredible and a well needed change of pace. I actually researched that they had to build an entire new engine, the Void engine, to be able to run this segment cleanly, which really proves that a lot of love went into this game, and it shows as the mission is the highlight of the game, and the one that people remember the most, that I would say anyway. And on our way, we also unlocked our next achievement, Dilapidation, by opening up a new path by destroying some support beams in the past to then use them as a path in the present. But anyways, back to the mission properly. To get the code to the door of the study, we need to find Aramis in the past to either kill him for the code or by snooping in his bizarrely open diary. We choose the latter of the two, and once we learn the code, we carefully punch it in, avoiding all the nearby guards and entering. Upon walking into the room, it flickers between past and present, before being greeted with the past versions of all the characters that we have seen so far. And through the cinematic, it says that Brianna and the Duke began to hear Delilah's voice, and they set up this meeting to perform a ritual to bring Delilah back from the void that we cast her in at the end of the Brigmore Witches. The ritual is performed successfully, and we find out that Delilah has stored her soul in a bone statue that the Duke has stored in his vault, and to kill her, we must find and retrieve the soul to give it back to her, then making her mortal again. We then exit the level and prepare for the next mission. The next mission has us, of course, taking on the Duke. We are told at the start of the level that the Duke actually has a body double that also walks around the house in order to make assassinating him much harder, but we can use this body double to our advantage, as we're told that we'll be able to tell who the body double is as he smokes and the actual Duke does not. So, once again, we set off and slowly make our way throughout the level until until we reach the palace. Once there, we casually sneak our way through all of its levels looking for the body double, who I'm actually just going to start calling Luca 2 for simplicity. Eventually, we find one of the Lucas in his chamber, so we wait for him to see if he starts smoking, which 
he actually does. So we talk to him. So then we accuse Luke too of being the body double and tell him that we are here to end Luca's life. So as an offer, we say that if we were to oppose Luca 1, would Luca 2 be able to successfully convince people he is in fact Luca 1 and rule far better than his predecessor? He says that he would absolutely love for that to happen, but to make it so, we need to bring him the real Luca so that he can take a medallion off of him, which Luca 1 uses to prove that he is the real deal. Simply swap it out and have him arrested. Also, something that I realised during this cutscene is the Duke is voiced by Vincent D'Onofrio, aka King Ping from Daredevil, and listening to this entire conversation, I couldn't hear anything else other than Kingpin, which I thought was hilarious. And guard officers will ask to see the medallion as proof. Luca never puts it aside. We find the real Duke can quickly perform a rather violent Heimlich manoeuvre before carting his ass back to bed. We dump him on the bed, grab our next achievement down with the Duke, and have him neutralised. Now it's time to grab the vault key and head there to steal Delilah's soul to return it to the sender. We find the bone statue, take it straight back, sealing it inside the heart that the outsider gave us, but at a cost of no longer being able to hear our mother. Afterwards, we picked up the Spirit Thief achievement before heading back to Megan for the final mission. Back on the boat before we head out for our final mission, we talk to Megan one more time who this time has a confession for us. Megan is in fact Billy Lark, the assassin that helped Dowd kill Emily's mother back in the first game. So we of course take out our rage before quickly reloading the save and allowing him to live, instead gaining us the achievement years ago another time. Now it's time to return to Dunwall Tower and take care of Delilah once and for all. Upon arriving, everyone for the most part has been completely slaughtered, including the security and overseers. The entire complex is now overflowing with witches, so we slowly head towards the castle for the final confrontation. On the way, we also find the grave of our mother and pay respect one more time, gaining the achievement gazebo. But enough dilly-dallying, it's time to end this. We enter the mansion, sneak our way through the complex, avoiding witches and clockwork robots in order to turn the power back onto the lift. However, on the way, we also find a chapel. We are told that we can create a corrupted room that once placed with the rest will sabotage Delilah's secret project. So we trek on and find the room where Delilah is once again working on a painting. We walk up, give her a soul back before she escapes into the said painting and beckons us to follow her. But we don't try just yet. First, we walk over to the throne and place the extra corrupted room, before then jumping through the artwork. Once there, we are teleported to a bizarre location called the Weld as it should be, which is what Delilah wants to create as Empress. After taking care of a couple of sneaky clones, which really threw me off the first couple attempts, Delilah then finally comes down to play. We give her a healthy dose of not breathing before carting her back through the painting, placing her upon the throne and trapping her in a fake weld in which she gets everything that she wants clueless on the fact that it's fake. We then free Corvo from the marble, and that's Dishonored too. We gain the Empress for completing the game with Emily, the greatest gift for freeing Corvo, as well as Shadow, Clean Hands, and In Good Conscience for completing the game without getting spotted, without getting killed, and in low chaos. However, now it's time to go through the entire game again, this time as Corvo, to get the High Chaos Corvo ending, as well as collecting most of the achievements that we missed on our Emily playthrough. So, let's go from the top. We start the game again, but this time, of course, we choose Corvo as our main character. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire story again in detail, just going to briefly describe the settings as we go for the achievements. So the first one we cross off the list is saving this journalist from a guard just outside of the castle, unlocking freedom of speech. Then continuing our path of murder, we quickly pick up Rogue for killing 20 enemies unaware, as well as break into this house to steal the contents of this safe. Now, this is important, but not until much later on. In the next mission, the first achievement we tackled and rather easily got was stay of execution for saving this man from being pushed into a wall of light. Now, something that I haven't mentioned yet is that in every mission there is a black market shop. You go here and buy equipment as well as unlock abilities and upgrades and that sort of thing. But by breaking into one of the shops, we gained the next achievement, Black Market Burglar. The next we tackled was Sliding Marksman for headshotting a character while sliding, which did take a couple of attempts as it is trickier than you may think, but not by much, so we eventually got it. Next, we got Heartbeat Reaper for killing six enemies in less than 1.5 seconds, and and then wrapping up this mission with Acrobat for drop assassinating 10 enemies. That's it for this mission, and since we're not done yet, in the next we first tackle is Fearless Fall, by climbing to the very top of the tower and drop assassinating one of the guards beneath. After that we kill Lady Hypatia, and then soon followed after that we then kill Lady Hypatia, and then crack onto the next level which we start in getting Heart Whispers for using the heart to listen to the secrets of 40 different people. We then stormed into Jin 
Nosh's house and assassinated him without moving a mechanism and without him knowing we were there at all for silence. And literally two minutes later, we unlocked Clockwork Collector for destroying three Clockwork robots and taking the plaque from the rubble. In the next mission, the first achievement that we gained was Circle of Life for chaining a single possession between a human, a hound, a rat, a fish, and a blood fly. Definitely a trickier one as you have to find the perfect spot with all of the creatures close by. Then once we entered the mansion and tore everything to shreds, we then used the heart to talk to the sisters of the Auricular Order for the achievement Auricular Echoes. We then took care of Brianna and moved on to the Dust District again. Once there we craft our 10th bone charm for the occult carver achievement before we then begin to tackle two achievements for killing one of the leaders and bringing his body to the other. So we start by killing the character Paolo, who is a warlock and when killed turns into a pile of rats. However, kill him three times and you'll actually kill him and unlock the achievement place of three deaths. We then deliver his cold, lifeless body to the vice overseer for faithful to the abbey before reloading the save and this time delivering the vice overseer to Paolo for howlers till the end. Time to move on to crack in the slab now where we quickly pick up under the table for stealing a key without knocking out any of the guards. Then traveling further through the level, we got flooded basement for finding a rune in a, well, you guessed it flooded basement that we had to drain the water to reach. During the next mission, the achievements just kept on popping. We got well funded for finding and taking 60% of all the loot in the game, which was actually a lot easier than it sounded. The next we tackled was tricky and took me a lot of reloading saves to be able to complete, Fatal Redirect. Now this one had us kill an enemy with his own bullet and even though I already done this in the first game multiple times, I kept failing this time as when I possessed a character I either ran into the bullet causing it to fire and not kill me or I took too long to get in front of it before it fired and just missed me. But you know me folks, I don't give up. So eventually we were successful and we got it. At the start of the last mission again for the first achievement we got is going back to the safe in the first mission and robbing it again for the second time. See, I told you it was important. We then got Art Collector for surprisingly collecting all of the paintings in the game. And speaking of collectibles, the next we got was Souvenirs for collecting all of the unique items that you can see stored in the display case in your room. But now it's time to finish the game once again and to collect the Royal Protector for finishing the game as Corvo and Empire in Chaos for completing it in High Chaos. Oh, uh, but we're not done. It's time to go through the entire game again, this time rejecting powers from the outsider to gain flesh and steel, which honestly wasn't difficult at all and only took us an extra couple of hours of grinding to get through. So we were 47 out of 50 achievements completed and only had a couple more to clear. The first we missed was one that we needed to complete as Emily, which is to link two characters together using Domino before one kills the other. So we reloaded an old save and got this fairly easily by taking a guard hostage and letting his friend just slice away. Karma if I've ever seen it. So only two left. The next two did require another playthrough though, but honestly I was speeding my way through this game so much I didn't even expect it to take long. And one of them didn't. The next achievement we got was Royal Spy Master for collecting all of the journals and audiographs by Billy and Sokolov on the whale. Not really a difficult one, but I just wasn't really paying attention I guess and I just missed it all three times. Now we're on to the final achievement and this one admittedly was a giant pain in the ass, Songs of Sekonos. This achievement had you find a musical duo across the missions three times and fully listen to the songs that they play. Now honestly, I nearly gave up on this achievement as I thought it was bugged, as I went through the game an extra three times fully trying to get this and it just did not pop. I would find the duo, listen to their songs in its entirety to the point that if I bumped into them halfway through, I would wait until they finish, play the entire song again, then listen to it all just to be safe. And the second encounter was also stupid as hell, as one in the dust district had you sneak into Paolo's complex and find a place to hide without disturbing them, but close enough so that you can actually listen to their songs. So even if you listen to all the songs all the way, you might not have been close enough for the tally to register, which means you carry on not knowing that you've already failed. So three times I went to the last duo, listened to their shitty music. I'm only joking about the shitty part. The music's actually fairly decent to listen to. I'm just salty. But then I decided I'm going to give it one more try. On this try, I got to each part that I needed to beat and waited there with my controller down for 20 minutes each, which is more than enough. I did this with all three duos and thankfully it decided to pop. No idea what I did different other than wait for 86 years, but who cares? Now I can murder them in cold blood and finally chalk Dishonored 2 as fully done. The grind is over. And I know that this isn't going to be the popular opinion, but I think Dishonored 2 is better than the first. 
and please hear me out. Now, I know that Dishonored was a genre-defining game that deserves all of the praise that it gets, but to me, Dishonored 2 was the same experience, just more fleshed out and honestly perfected. The world design is phenomenal, and all of the locations were beautiful and well thought out. The combat system has been improved brilliantly, as one of my complaints about Dishonored 1 was the lack of stealth tools. You only had sleep darts and knocking people out, and you couldn't even really use your powers. Whereas in this, you have several new stealth tools and takedowns, as well as the ability to use your powers to help plan your next moves and attacks, which I thought was fantastic. The characters were fine and the story was fine as well. It kept me entertained and to be honest, that's all I need from a story. I can be quite easy to please and I know that. Now, don't get me wrong, there were some things that I didn't like. A couple of missions felt a bit unnecessary and just there to really fill the content and sometimes the AI of the enemies was a little bit temperamental and sometimes I got caught in places I really shouldn't have. But on the whole, I think this game is a massive improvement on Dishonored 1 for the most part. And the only thing that I think stunted people from properly giving it a decent shot was its rather buggy launch, which unfortunately unfortunately stopped a lot of its momentum. If you folks like Dishonored 1 and didn't give 2 a chance, I'm begging you to revisit it. I really feel like Dishonored 2 deserves a second chance for some. So, that's done. Let's move on to the stats. Dishonored 2 took roughly 33 hours to complete and get all 50 achievements. I'm going to give this game an 8.5 out of 10 and say that the achievements were a decent 4 out of 10, as they involved multiple playthroughs, a couple of slightly tricky achievements, and doing the stupid song one, which I am also going to say that for me, it was the hardest achievement, although of course it may be different for you. But these achievements were far easier than Dishonored 1, DLC aside. However, Dishonored Death of the Outsider, I wonder how those achievements fare, and if they will be easy to obtain. Well, I'm sure you'll find out in two weeks time after my next episode of The Achievement Grind coming out next Sunday. But that's it from me today folks, thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed Dishonored 2, and please let me know down below why you agree or disagree with my very bold statement on this game. But that's enough talking from me, don't forget to like and subscribe, and follow me on Twitch where we grind these live as well, and have some really exciting ones planned in the future, and I shall see you all in the next week's episode, which should be a lot of fun. Thank you all so much. Take care. Bye-bye for now.